Okay, we're entering part two on this. Above right here in this picture are symbols from around the world. that are showing the swastika in many different people that at one time must have had contact with this one certain people that it is associated with and or got it from somebody who directly did. In the top right hand corner we see the Anasazi of the Southwest in America, Aztec, an Iraqi bowl that's already been shown before, the Etruscans in the center of the top and that gold symbol. I just recently did a video on that and showed you who they used to be. But even in the USA, car companies, and believe it or not, the postal system and other things, next to that it's easier to recognize the German version of it with the Iron Cross situation. But that Iron Cross that's the background of that is also shown in ancient Sumerians. Russia. Strangely, whenever you start looking at this and then you know the idea of what was supposed to happen, how these other people had this little symbol, so what, what are we talking about here? Because Russia had it there. India that we're currently talking about, but a few other places too. Next row down is Poland, the Navajo Indians even. There's a skull cap with it on there in Tibet. In a lot of these places, people, this is not like, oh, we found one. It's like all over the place. Peru, but the ancient Hittites of the Fertile Crescent up in Anatolia. The Hopewell Indians, but this is actually made from two snakes coming together, which has a Conan the Barbarian reference inside there, but that's for a whole nother video. I've already done one series on it, but there are things, of course, that I left out and could put together in a whole nother envelope of ideas. Next to that is Japan, the Basque people. Down on the bottom row there, that is an Israel. In fact, I could show you one that in, it shows it in Israel where it's the Star of David, as we know it today, next to the swastika in a pattern. Ethiopia, shown in the next to it right there in the windows of the built-in stone moss that's there. In ancient Armenia, in Italy, in Iran, and so you would have to say Sumer or Babylon, if you will, and so on. Korea even though, people. The Anglo-Saxons with that ring that's there. The Thracian people, which we talked about last year and we're confirmed we know they are from and attached to. In fact, ever since the 17th century, scholars have noted similarities among more than one of 400 dialects of the Indo-European languages with these similarities. Researchers agree that they can all be traced back to one ancestral language called Proto-Indo-European, which is referred to as Pi now, which used to, until after the end of World War II, used to be called Aryans, and people wrote it down as such, such as King Darius of Persia and so on. Let me go back here a little, little slot or two and show you that they have found R1A, 1A1, by the way, in ancestral people that are leaving out of this central Caucasus Mountain Black Sea area in towards Europe on a first swing, making ancient Celts. But later again also and then everybody knows about the Anglo-Saxons like we showed the ring about and so on but that was a later wave things like this happened to India itself too there always seemed to have been like a oh a, a, a test run 
or a group of people that would apparently get back together with each other and then take over as much area as they could. If we really look at it, it doesn't seem like they went in and just took over your spot. They went and found a river valley next to it, such as the Indus River Valley, and built that up. And it seems like it happened more like a cargo cult in a way of the people flocking towards them than this idea that they were all killed off and he, they ran through and did all these things. Sure, there are fanciful tales. Sure, there were battles and all kinds of things that went on through it. But in the reality of it, it was much more benign than what's led on to by the Mahabharata and so on. But in that Mahabharata, you can see there are a few places that Indra is referred to as having a blonde beard and hair and so on too. And of course, riding on the chariots and so on that they're talking about in there with horses and all this, that wasn't in India. That's from the people that brought it to India. Let me see if I can get back to one more picture here. Because if I get to this one, you can see the ancient Celts all from left to right, if you will, this expanse of the Yamnaya culture, which no longer was the Yamnaya culture. It was a courted word culture heading west and so on and different groups out of that. And they intermingled with other people, but were dominant. And then those people became the people that went into certain areas. But you see Celtic in two forms right there, Italic, Balkan, even the Greeks down here. So they actually are Proto-Indo-European, even though they talked about Scythians and all this stuff. If you really look into it, they knew a lot about these people. And in fact, a lot of the words that we have or that the Greeks had and so on are loan words directly from the Scythians, including gods. Like Jupiter is actually Dios Pater, and that's the Sky Father. Same thing in there when it turns into Zeus. Same thing whenever it's over in India too eventually and I have a series from a couple of years ago where I talked about storm gods and how all these other people had this pantheons going on and then isn't it strange that every single one of these people all of a sudden bloomed into an idea of having a leader god, not really monotheism, but one that was on top of everything and whenever it did so, it was always a storm god. Pretty much everywhere except for Egypt, and they even did still have one down in the Delta region, but due to a lack of storms and so on, your storm god would like rarely be showing up. And I also, another video showed you the problems of people that were facing droughts and so on in this situation and the lengths that they would go to sometimes, but that's not for the breadth of this video. You see above Celtic and purple, there's Germanic people that are there, Slavic, Baltic, but then across the center there, right off Anatolia is this Scythians and Iranic type peoples, the Medes, the Parthians, even the Persians. And of course that attaches all the way over into Vedic and Indo Aryans that are there. And all these are correct terms, and they're not Eurocentric or anything else. This is, if I was an archaeologist from the planet Zenthor, this is what would be talked about. So let's get into the meat of this, because just in one part, with Scandinavia, they talk about the battle axe culture that's coming on, and roughly about 5,000 years old, whenever this one wave came through, there was a battle axe culture. This is the people that have the double battle axe. But strangely, we see that in the Minoans too, don't we? In fact, we, that battle axe culture seems to be attached to a few different people. 
just like the corded wear people and so on. But those are all variations on a theme. So haplogroups, DNA, things like this are actually validating this whole situation. In fact, once it all came out in India, they're now throwing a fit and want to get rid of the highest class and keep themselves and themselves are actually a mix. Which we showed in the first one and that the far south of India are actually more related to these Andaman Island people and that's the connective that's there on those. And so there was basically just that type of people. And then the Aryans came in and now you have a huge blend of a mix and a caste system that's just dwindling away now. I should read this abstract that's right here talking about they, where they lived from 20,000 years before present down to 12,000 years and then all of a sudden at the Younger Dryas event they were in Hindustan and went across to Anatolia and the rest of Asia Minor and are apparently between 10,000 and 9,000 years before present. Hmm, kind of Gobekli Tepe area in timing. At around 9,000 to 8,000 years BP, they arrived at the Balkans and spread over Europe east of the British Isles on this migration way or before its bearers of R1A, the parent upstream haplogroup. So as I've said before, it's not exactly this one haplogroup. Well, it seems to stem off of it. Well, yeah, but R is derived out, out of N, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, that goes back to Cro-Magnon Man at 20, 29,000 B.C. Paglisi Cave, they checked him out, got the full genome out of him. He still exists today. That kind of set science on their ear when they tried to say, oh, there was all this uh, evolution of people that came out of Africa that because of being in the cold and it's like no when they came out they were fully modern didn't have the neanderthal admix yet but that happened shortly but uh hmm funny how archaeology quite often shows you something different than the narratives that try to get told and it's it's really self-exposing sometimes but uh other times people are not even aware of it in any way shape or form so the earliest signs of the language on passing of bearers to the R1, the people of Anatolia, were picked by the linguist and dated about 9400 to 9600 to around 10,100 years before present. Putting it uh, really about the idea, I know that's small to read people, but it's kind of hard for me even reading it off the screen here, but so um, the data of DNA geology uh, deserved in this work at the time as bearers of the brother haplogroup R1B1A began to populate Europe after 4,800 year, uh, 4,800 years before present. And haplogroup R1R1A moved to the Russian uh, plain around 4,800 to 44 years before present. So. As I've talked about and discussed, and can't really show you a picture, but they went here and over to the west, up through, and then back all the way across, and then that's what we know of later is the Proto-Europeans that came in the very end part, with after the Germanics and the uh, people of uh, the Saxons and all of that that we know about. But that was really a late form. It had already happened before. And they talk about R1B there. R1B is what King Tut is also. So in a lot of these things, they talk about how it goes with the Europeans, but they don't want to talk too much about where it blurbs out too much. Sanskrit with his linguistics and everything, and the fact that the British were over India at the time and they noticed it and the connections and then when it all came out even this guy named Taklik something it's got a very India type name but back in the 1890s he came out with a book saying that 
a lot of the things they say in the book there relate to being way up north and not where we're talking about here. And he said he was talking about something around the Arctic Circle even perhaps. That it's way up there. It's not even just the Himalayas right over here. We're there to get a lot of snow onto it, but it's something quite different. So let's get into this because we're going to look at a portion of a BBC thing and see if we can whisk this by this time. That's why the last one got cut off. And Indo-European languages and religions to the rest of the ancient world. I'm just finishing off a studio session because we're making a new documentary about the Aryan civilization, trying to find out whether they existed or not, where their homeland was, what kind of language they spoke. And I've been in Siberia and Kazakhstan. This was because we were trying to find, as I said, the root of the Aryan culture. Um, so you see in that map, let me go back and have her say it again, where Kazakhstan is. If you take the K-A-Z part of that, that's right up around the Caspian Sea and so on like that, but spread out all in this middle part. What, where did they all go? Well, everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go, and that symbol followed them too, and also blue-eyed people, blue-eyed statues and so on. The change that we just looked at to coming into her speaking was the Sumerian statue of a priest king. There are other ones of the gods and so on too, and they always have these lapis lazuli eyes. Same effect is found in Egypt, but they even have ones with crystal blue eyes that look like they follow you around the room. And this is the earliest dynasties, but actually they're there in the pre-dynastic. And I showed you recently in a video where even back before World War II, they were talking about how there was this Nordic type people there along with these Mediterranean type people and their different types of skulls and how they were the ones that started off Egypt, but then they got another rise again, it seems, by looking at the skulls here, and around the 18th dynasty, and we find that led through the biggest, most famous time, when of course of King Tut, Akhenaten, Seti, Ramses, and things like that, that really set it apart as something totally different but you can also find, well, they'll tell you that right where that K is, pretty much of Kazakhstan, that all blue-eyed people are related to a people that used to live there right around the end of the last ice age. And so whenever you see blue-eyed people all over the place, and we're fixing to show you some in some odd places, it might show you the breadth of where these people went and what they did. And you might try to look at it as a conquering people or this, that, and the other, but those people are still there. And now they have civilization. Rewind back time, they would all do it again, I'm sure. Then again, there's probably a few that we'd leave out of the situation, huh? Wink, wink. So trying to find out whether or not they did exist or this, that, and the other. I'm sure right off the bat she figured out, oh yeah, they did exist. What's all this? What's all that? And they took her out to a place in the middle of nowhere. Well, let me describe it better. They went to a place that if I named it, you wouldn't know what the hell I'm talking about. And that was a big ride from a place that you might know in Russia that I'm talking about. And that's still a couple of hundred miles away from a place in Russia you've probably really heard about, if you follow me. But after they make it down that road to all that thing, then this guy takes an off-road Land Rover type thing out, and it's still seven hours away, basically through the land of nothing. Sitting there, and what does she find? This is because we were trying to find, as I said, the root of the Aryan culture. Um, there are some incredible new excavations there, Bronze Age excavations. What's particularly fascinating about them is that these cities are covered with swastika imagery. So rather than just looking at them as an archaeologist, you have to think, what is the political implication of these places? Well, you would hope that there's really nothing. People are way past World War II and the idea there 
But what does it come about with? What does it show as a people and who did what? And if you could make a connection to that. Because Caucasians, if you haven't noticed, really aren't into bragging so much. They don't go around and go, we went to space and start getting up in people's faces and stuff like that, like you see other people try to do even when they're lying. There's no real braggart towards that. I don't know, it says in your Bible, the meek shall inherit the earth, but I don't know, I putting two and two together here. But, so she has to go out in the middle of nowhere. Well, I'm gonna back this up just a hair here for something she said a second ago. Because you see this symbol that's here, and you would just think if you couldn't read it that maybe they found that symbol out there like she's talking about. No, that's a Minoan pot. Yeah, that's been, that's a Minoan pottery found from Crete. The Minoan civilization flourished from 3000 to 1100 BC, and then it got destroyed, of course, in the big volcanic eruption and so on that went on there. But it actually goes back well before that they give that 3,000 whenever it's kicking real good. But of course, just like Egypt before the first dynasty, there were people there for a long time. It just got put together to a point. And archaeology wants to agree with that point, but say that anything before that must be mythological or so messed up, they're not going to mess with it. Even though it goes back to this 10,000 years. And then even further with some that everybody would agree with myth is mythological. But anyhow, Minoans. Now they're going to take her out in the middle of nowhere and then drive seven hours through nowhere. This is are covered with swastika imagery. So rather than just looking at them as an archaeologist, you have to think what is the political implication of these places. Um, and certainly a lot of people, uh, a lot of very high up heads of state have gone to visit these digs to try to see if they should associate themselves with these forsookers because this is probably where the Aryans, the original Aryans, lived and worshipped and founded what is probably the basis of Western and Eastern civilization. Founded what is probably the basis of Western and Eastern civilization. Founded what is probably the basis of Western and Eastern civilization. I was there with the chief archaeologist, Professor Stanovich, and he drove me seven hours out into the steppe grasslands. I had no idea where we were going, and he took me to this amazing expanse of grass, and you couldn't really tell there was anything special about it, and suddenly... The nothing had came long ago to where, just like Gobekli Tepe, and there's 14 sites associated with it, that are all just up under a bump of the land. These people took and, and took uh, drones out there and flying over and stuff, and you'd found these squarish and these circles and stuff kind of barely showing up, just like they do in a lot of the uh, British Isles and so on, and found all these other sites that are going on that they didn't even know they didn't know they knew. see the people that are supposedly associated with this but it's a grass and you couldn't really tell there was anything special about it and suddenly he didn't speak any english but we kind of communicated by sign language suddenly as he pointed to the ground i realized that i was walking across a buried city every now and again you suddenly notice these kind of ghostly shapes in the grassland which were the shapes of fortresses and cattle sheds and homes and religious sites. And I would not have seen those cattle sheds and homes and religious sites. And I wouldn't... There we go. So you can see in this, this wheel inside a wheel, spoked and running around. There have been people that checked this with its angles and that running through this whole place and this deal at your bottom right that looks like an entrance going through a little tunnel that the sun comes in there that's an equinoxal point to it that everything there is done in sacred geometry to certain lengths the question was why is it offset just a little bit with the circle being more pressed to the top 
well somebody else figured out I'd have to show you a whole video about this it take well I say 20 minutes 15 20 minutes it'd take me an hour but the if, if I was to show you rather than just go meh you know but you know how the Aztec wheel is like a wheel that rolls inside of a wheel and so where its points are touching that makes the calendar and they've made it like that so it rolls like a spirograph if you remember what I'm talking about this is a spirograph situation that goes on right here with it but this has all been buried up and it's just a little mound and there's a creek that runs right near there that after the snow gets flooded a little bit not so much and some perfect land that's around it and everything but it's the middle of nowhere and there's some mountains over here a little more i don't know which direction we're aiming at but in my mind it's a little bit more almost directly left to north left that they've got a picture of looking back across it again like this but it has in the distance the mountains that are there and so you can see the radical difference that's there but walking on this you would have no idea probably and now this thing, you can tell people have been out here driving trucks all over and all kinds of things there, but what they're driving the trucks over and those lines there are walls. This thing has basically been buried up to where it just doesn't exist anymore. It's the nothing. And you saw pictures earlier of Arkham, and that's either this exact site or one very similar to it. And this also has that idea of Stonehenge built into it. Not Hasinos had he not opened my eyes to what lay beneath my feet. Archaeological digs have shown that the ancient town was inhabited by the forebears of the Aryan race. Yeah, what's it? Those ancient Aryans were credited with everything on Earth. They were even said to have discovered metals. There are quite a few things that these people are credited with. Some of it seems strange and some of it seems like it all got lumped onto them somehow because it doesn't seem to predate them. They seem to be the only one that has certain accoutrements that go on with this. And then also a lot of mythology, which anybody in contact with these people had a similar mythology but variations on a theme it's almost made sure that it goes a certain way but other than that it can go a little willy-nilly and people made up and based and their their own like the Greeks and stuff on this concept and a sky father and the whole situation and they filled in the pantheon and people always say they got everything from Egyptians but if you'll really look into it they got the kernel of everything from the Sumerians. In fact, even during the time of Alexander the Great, whenever Sumerian was no longer known, the cuneiform writing, and then we had changed two or three times to Akkadian and so on, the Greeks still had the ancient language written down, and there are tablets that they have recording whenever Alexander the Great takes over. Well, actually, one of them records Darius being an Aryan and king of kings and then whoopsie apparently this is being recorded during that time because now all of a sudden Alexander the Great's king of kings and sadly on the next tablet it tells you the king has died yeah a lot of the information we got out of Alexandria and everything, and people, oh, no, 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 Egypt, that was com being compiled by Alexander's people after that, the Ptolemaic dynasties. Sure, it had a lot of their stuff in there. What you don't realize is it had a whole lot of those Sumerian tablets and stuff, too. It's where, you know, Eratosthenes was able to figure out the thing with the size of the earth and other things that were found out you can find that the Sumerians already knew that preemptive they already had this sacred geometry going on they already had the Pythagorean theorem and everything I've got a video lined up of about 40 I've got in line here showing that effect and the Plimpton 233 tablet I believe is the number on it 
and how they found out that it's got advanced trigonometry here. It's based on base six and all kinds of things. Yeah, these math freak outs took it and got the numbers off of it. And then somebody figured out, hold on a minute, let me grab that calculator over there. Cosine to a what? Oh my gosh. Check the next one. Oh wow. And they figured it out. And it was in a pile of tablets that were basically looked at as being, yeah, uh, it's got a bunch of numbers on it. A lot of these are whenever they trade in grain and they almost go down to the individual grain. I mean, you got huge numbers, this, that, and the other. Yeah, well, some of them go into decimal points too. I've said before, if you want to find a lost civilization, we're looking at them right now because what you're brought up and taught that they might have even known versus what we know already now that they had going on, totally different. So much more. Back to India. India is today dominated by the politics of Hindu nationalism, an ideology which is fiercely nativist and blindly rejects findings in genetics, linguistics, or archaeology. For example, it doesn't matter to many modern Indians that ancient Vedic texts describe the ancient Aryans as having horses and chariots, which are not present in India's fossil record until these migrations from the steppes. It didn't exist. In fact, Sanskrit didn't exist. In fact, all of these buildings and the intricately carved temples and things that you see on there all date to a time that correlates with this. I find it odd that they had structures like the wheels, this, that, and the other. All of a sudden they get with another culture and I guess because of the flair and the new soup they create and ideas come out of it that they came into this real intricate artwork. It also has to do with the type of rock they were having to deal with. But... The key word for horse in Sanskrit, asa, is exactly the same thousands of miles away in Lithuania. In Lithuania. It's spelt a hair different. Listen, that's just linguistics and so on. You look at some words even in America, that are French and stuff, it, it's, it's odd, the connections they have on that. How do you pronounce each one? What is it? Well, if you pronounce it the same way, if I say it to you in these two different cultures, you'll write it down slightly different. It's the same word for a horse. Now he's going to talk to a lady that I've seen in another video, too, talking with him about these Aryans and how they get what that comes from and I want you to notice how she cocks her eyes at him whenever she says this but let's continue horses are not known in the Indus civilization and yet they're a key part of the society of the Rig Veda chariots were drawn by the horses they used to ride the horses and it was very familiar animal to them and I think that they tamed the horse at a very early period this is the first uh, movement of Aryans. And you see here, basically their homeland, and then wee, 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 over the river and through the woods to Grandma's house we go down, and you find the Indus Valley situation, which is encroaching on the top of India right there. And this is where this all happened. At. And again, he made another video because the genetics has come out with a confirming paper and the locals there that are in a secondary caste system have all been getting together and bitching about it and now when this came out they go look there, there are all these Russian Aryan people they weren't even really from here well the thing is is they, they've been there well they've been there once before but it was that test run situation but they've been there since 2000 BC roughly built up through the to 1500 BC and then things really got kicking but they've been there 
a long, long time. This isn't something that happened a couple of generations ago, people. And it's validated now. Now, look at the way she cocks her eyes when she tells you what Arian's about. Is this the name they call themselves? And what does it mean? It actually means the civilized, the sub-peer, the socialized, civilized no. person. Yes. Civilized, yeah. refined person. Yeah. And so they use the word Arya. That's what they call themselves. Yeah. It's what they call themselves. It's believed that actually they were called that by so many people in a variation of form of that same linguistics we're talking about that it kind of stuck. You think that Ari doesn't attach to things, but there is a pyramid of El Arian in Egypt. There's a famous star cluster constellation known as Orion. even some modern form of words. It might take you back to thinking about the rich men on the Titanic and what they all had to do with, with the word aristocrat is derived from this exact same linguistics. And it mean the same thing, the movers and shakers. And the people that were calling them this were everywhere they went because they brought a more advanced way to these people. If they had something go on, going on, they helped to enhance that if they could in any way and got them building real good pottery so they could trade with other people and so on. Or they had certain things that they could exploit that they knew that other people didn't have and they really want that, so you can jack up the price on that, da da da, because these people were also hooked up with the ancient spice trade and the ancient Silk Road well before the Silk Road. I've done a recent video about that. In fact, over here on the left, we're looking at prehistoric rock art showing you a swastika. And also in Iran, a 3,200-year-old swastika gold necklace in, uh, excavated from Marlik, Galan province. This is in northern Iran. So... Yeah, connectives there. Let's let Robert go. What's he got? Well, the term Aryan is confined to describing a linguistic group in modern times. It is also etched into stone millennia ago in places like Iran by Darius the Great. It says, is be hissed an inscription right here on the left with that same necklace where he got the picture. I am Darius, the great king, the king of kings the king of many countries and many people, the king of his expensive, expansive lands, the son of Wishtaspa of Archimedes, Persian, the son of a Persian, Aryan from the Aryan race. You can look up Herodotus and he tells you at the same time in ancient times the Greeks called Iranians Kafe but they were renowned as Aryans among themselves and their neighbors. In another part of this book, Herodotus writes that the Medians were also known as Aryans during a certain period. So in two of the oldest written human documents, the race of Iranians have been mentioned as being Aryans. Not necessarily the people that you think of as being there today. But I've shown in my work where demographics have radically changed. I was recently told by somebody they have a genetics paper that just came out at the end of last year I don't know anything about. And it's more enlightening because apparently it's not about these swamp Arab type of genetics that are there, but looking at older genetics, hopefully. And I get a hold of it and you know I'll be all over it. So Herodotus, in this same story, if you'll go through this whole story is there, he describes a few more people and tells you that the uh, ancient word for the Nile was the river R. And so what would you call people that lived off the river R exclusively? Maybe Aryans. That's just a fluke thing. But in that same deal, he tells you all these people used to be called Aryans. 
until Medea came from Athens and the Medes changed their name. He tells you another place, just as Perseus did, and the Persians changed their name. He referred to his race and lineage as Aryan, which is why I use the term, which is also used to describe Buddha, who was a blue-eyed Aryan, according to ancient writings and why he is depicted with blue eyes, even today, in places like Thailand. Well, there are all over the Orient, if you will, and parts of Asia, showing Buddha in this situation. I was on Chief X channel trying to talk about this. Well, actually I wasn't. I was trying to show him another thing that hooks up a Nordic people and all that to the idea so it was kind of like an irrefutable situation and I got him to agree blue eyed statues all these reserve heads do you see why they called it Nordic but then we had this guy nature boy show up and he wanted to tell everybody that uh, Buddha was actually a uh, uh, psychedelic mushroom and not even a person and so on and the other guy wants to say that I'm all trying to be Eurocentric and I go no I'm not trying to be Eurocentric I never said Europe, idiot. I said Asia, that he's Asiatic. And at the time, these blue eyes Asiatics were around all over the place. There's other pictures of it, shows it right there. Shows you a thing that you would say, well, that must be Buddha on the right and this red-headed guy on the left and the guy on the left is doing a symbol and you're trying to figure it out. And you're like, no, no, the guy on the left is teaching the guy on the right. You know, the alkaline noses and stuff that are on these. Maybe it freaks people out whenever they have that dip on their eye that's there that shows something different. But genetics says one thing. How about another? How about Buddha himself? He has some 27 proverbs to try to make yourself a noble man. What's number 23? Well, it just says blue eyes. What? Yeah, th then we could go on with the idea of mushrooms or the other guy trying to claim that Buddha was black because his hair looks like Bantu knots and he goes well if you, if even Chief said you look closely at that that snails of course I can tell you that has to do with sacred geometry and all this other situation just like a pine cone or a sunflower or a lot of other things let's continue I he is depicted with blue eyes even today in places like Thailand while certain words, such as Aryan, have been changed into words like Indo-European, which means the same thing, certain historically Aryan symbols, such as a swastika, which goes back many thousands of years, are being scrubbed from academia altogether. This brings up the question, why? Whatever the reason, what cannot be denied is the reality a 4,000 year old blonde red headed mummies. Stop it right there in mid sentence. Hate to do it, but he, he's got a way of making it fade before he ends his sentence. So, uh, this is the beauty of Lulan. It was put on exhibit in America's here, and as soon as it did, people go, Well, this don't have the straight hair of an oriental lady. This doesn't have any of the things. People that had already seen mummies before and everything, they were like, this, this is a European type lady. To the point actually that the uh, Chinese took their exhibit back. These are people known as Takarians. And they dressed like Jedis. And they had thin swords and everything that almost make you think they were like Jedis and they were free skiing guys that you did not mess with in any way. And it's like, that sounds like a Jedi. Then again, earlier we saw the ladies riding the horses that are attached to the Amazons. So when, they, when we talk about this, it's not just one people, da da da, it's a whole group of people and because it swelled out into all the surrounding people, 
and dominated them. It's actually a few different sets of people here all doing this with common genetics that we found in Egypt with King Tut, Nakanaten, and so on. I wonder if we'll find in this Sumerian one. What we've never had in the Sumerians is nobility, priest king DNA, or anything like that in any way. And of course we know what up north is, but... The night is the reality of 4,000-year-old blonde, red-headed mummies discovered in places like China, which predate the arrival of East Asians to the area by several millennia. Yeah, much earlier, before China ever came into the area that we call China today, and I did a recent video about this. Uh, actually, I did one that's Robert Sepper's version of the Yellow Emperor. And it shows you the connectives to these people that had been there for at least 1,400 years before the Chinese people even showed up. And all these pyramids that are attached to these same type of people that apparently have that same genetics as King Tut kind of did. And then if you look at the ancient paper that I showed in that other video, where Egyptologist 7 uses that guy's own information against him, in that they talk about the Nordic people starting it all off and which group of pre-dynastic they were, and that is what we know now today that Narmer came from and so on. So that's got a hookup. So what, what, what do you got going on? Well, it showed up again strong and rode for a while again in the 18th dynasty. Yeah, there were hiccups in Egypt and so on going on, but hard to get someone to believe that this person right here's genetics that have been found way up and curled over China would have the same genetics as somebody in Egypt. But that's because you're taught to believe one thing versus, well, what you're usually not taught at all, huh? Aryan mummies that share genetic affinities to the many blonde and red-headed mummies of pharaohs in Egypt. So here we find a lot of them. Bottom left-hand corner is Thuya and Yuya. He looks like Abraham Lincoln with blonde hair. She looks like a cotton girl, cottony type of girl or a farm girl type of thing. They both have blonde hair. Next to him on the bottom right is uh, Seti. Uh, that's him again in the top left-hand corner too, by the way. And sure, they say, well, he might have had some henna put on his hair. Why is he trying to mimic a redhead in the first place? Even Ramses has this blondish hair. And they checked it and they said, no, he was kind of a strawberry blonde in his youth. A Shepset right here, which always, it's funny, right next to my corner, she's smiling. Yeah. And then Queen Ty right here, which in a lot of the pictures it always shows real dark, but anything that's got any kind of flash to it at all will show that she's got auburn hair. And I am not sure on being able to show you more and more blondes. Like Khufu's granddaughter is shown as being a strawberry blonde girl made with yellow ochre and then red ochre lines. If you look at it real close, it's just little lines on it, but you get back 10, 15 foot and it turns into a strawberry blonde look with a glean on the front of it where they didn't do any lines. It's kind of amazing. There's also Ginger, the pre-dynastic blonde haired Gibeline mummy. spanning all dynasties, reflected in the blue-eyed Egyptian statues of their nobility and pharaohs. Of course, many people refused to follow the science. So papers came out, and some, some of them were trying to be somewhat forgiving about the concept, but still let you know what the reality it was versus the ancients, telling you things like Egyptian mummies have European and Turkish DNA. Well, they don't actually have Turkish DNA from Turkish people, but ancient Anatolians. Well, I have another video coming up that's showing you well, a lot of the Irish component came out of ancient Anatolia. The Scots came out of ancient Anatolia in North Africa. That there are genetics connected to there, not just up here. And in fact, the Scythians that we're talking about now, and everybody always thinks of them as being some far as distant thing, in the Holy Lands, right above Galilee, as we know it, was Scythopolis. 
things like that will let you put the 10 tribes together or 12 tribes as it was and work off of that idea of who they were trying to talk about with Caucasians that weren't very mixed at the time. So those living 50 miles south of Cairo between 3,400 and 1,600 years ago were more related to East Mediterraneans than Africans. And when they're talking about Africans, even Caucasian Africans. But the Berbers there have components that show up, like in Ramses and so on too. And there are people in Sub-Saharan Africa that have been admixed, and so they show up with R1B, V88, or they show up with E1B genetics, and that's not normal. But some papers actually cut through the idea and tell you. Instead, opting to follow their feelings, virtue signaling in favor of political correctness. Yeah, it's a thing nowadays for people to virtue signal and go, oh. In fact, during my livelihood, it seems like it's been a thing to try to act ambiguous about Egypt. And you see people now in a modern day and they'll do these documentary things and then act ambiguous about it. It's like, we had this figured out. When I was a kid studying it, a lot of the stuff I studied was the older stuff before World War II. And lo and behold, there was a lot of stuff in there that they never talk about anymore, like Nordic type skulls and this, that, and the other. <coughs> well, what sounds strange about that is Nordic people being down in the Egypt, you know, south of the Mediterranean and so on. But there were Nordic people running all over the Mediterranean. They weren't really Nordic. You know of these Nordic people today as being the Norse and where we all get that from, but that's not where they used to be. In fact, the Nordic area that we associated with them in Scandinavia and everything used to be under a continental ice shelf. Nobody was Norse until the Norse. Ancient Egyptians more closely related to Europeans than modern Egyptian scientists claim. You know, it's hilarious with all the Afrocentricism when it came out, they go, well, a few more different articles came out about different things and key points they wanted to go with. They, yeah, they got into deep on it and they said, uh, Sub-Saharan admix ends up showing up post-Roman periods. Whenever blacks tried to claim that, oh, we, we started it and they stole it from us and all this, which is actually a cargo cult response that Robert did another video on. That's the reason I keep saying he's knocking it out of the park because four or five in a row here, people have just been crammed full of knowledge and showing you things in a certain way. But we're talking about India, but no, we're talking about other places too. And you know in the Bible where he supposedly did this area of Sumer and India and all of that and the cities that were all named that Cain went to and the verses other people in the Hamites down here and then Japheth up north. Well, lo and behold, they all have blue eyed genetics. Noah was said to be a pale little blushing baby with blue eyes that made the room glow, but then of course you have to see that he's being looked at as being deified or something at birth that has this special birth, just like Jesus or a lot of other situations do because right off the bat he stood up and started talking rather than scientific correctness which brings us back to Kumar Yadav the leader of India's National People's Party who's calling for the lower social classes to chase away their upper caste demographics which has sparked the political class war in India Yadav stated that since DNA tests prove Brahmins are from Russia and other European countries, and despite their Aryan ancestors being mentioned in ancient epics like the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Vedas, and Puranas, the traditionally noble class should leave and turn over power to his party. Many people in India are divided over these remarks. I can imagine. You can also imagine whenever the British were there and stuff that it was known that they had already been there once before. 
I heard responses about this, and it's like the British have never been there before. No, these people that are here helping us out, they were here before. But you get a generation or two of people hushing that idea up and things, and you never really hear about it anymore, and then you never hear about it anymore, do you? Just like things that were known about Egypt, which, again, now we're so lucky that they kept themselves to the point that there's a possibility of getting DNA out of the people, especially being cooked in that desert over and over again. But, you know, you get down a few feet below the sand and it stays pretty stable and it doesn't go through a freezing period. So it's it's actually much better. But it's we're more lucky that they actually kept themselves. But in the graveyard that they found there, that Brigham Young's been doing for almost 20 years now and looked at millions are in the process of going through millions of bodies. The one thing that they found that was odd is that everybody's separated by hair color there. There are dark-haired people all through here, but then all of a sudden it starts off red-headed people, and all these people are redheads. And then over in this area, everybody's light-headed and blonde-headed. What's up with that? Did they... I mean, the families weren't all, like, strict, necessarily. Kind of strange. But this guy who's really half Aryan himself, probably, wants them to kick the other guys out because they find out genetic-wise that they're from the European-type people from up Russia as they call it, but that's the open grasslands of Russia in the ancient of times. Where are those people now? That's why they mention Europeans. The same reason they mention the Egyptians are closely to uh, put it in the computer. What's it say? But ding! Western European people. In fact, if we take a few hundred years off, I wouldn't put Tsar Nicholas back in. There we have R1B again and R1A in Russia. With some refusing to accept that there was any migrations to India ever, of course, these same Indo-Europeans migrated into Europe, which many modern Europeans take offense to. Yep, so here's something that I've got pulled up, and here goes Robert again with it, because uh, I just said earlier that I'm going to show you Ancient Anatolians and people of the Scythians is what ended up making some of the Irish people that are there. Scientists have sequenced the first ancient human genomes from Ireland, shedding light on the genesis of the Celtic population. The genome is uh, an instruction booklet for building a human comprising three billion pair of DNA letters. The work shows that early Irish farmers were similar to Southern Europeans. Genetic patterns then changed dramatically in the Bronze Age as newcomers came through there that were of Anatolian region. Details of this work by genetics of Trinity College in Dublin, archaeologists from Queen's University, Belfast, and so on, is there. Let's look at it one more time, another article and reject, despite DNA showing that many Irish, for example, can also trace their ancestry to places like Eurasia and the Middle East. Irish DNA originated in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Hmm, what's that? It's, that's to do with Stone Age farmers. Genome analysis shows mass migration of Stone Age farmers from the Fertile Crescent Again, this is how you can put in the idea of this 12 lost tribe, these people that were there that dispersed, that, oh, where are they lost at? They're not lost. Fertile Crescent and Bronze Age settlers from Eastern Europe was foundation of Celtic populations. Oh, snap. Well, let's look at those Nordics. Can also trace their ancestry to places like Eurasia and the Middle East. Even Vikings genetics have been shown to have entered Northern Europe from places like Asia and the Mediterranean. Asia and the Mediterranean. 
New Viking DNA testing shows nearly all of them were part Asian. We found that Vikings weren't just Scandinavians in their genetic ancestry as we analyzed genetic influences in their DNA from Southern Europe and Asia, which has never been completed before, said Martin Skipra, lead author and associate professor of Center for Geogenetics, University of Copenhagen. That's because after World War II, this thing was thrown onto it of this white guilt and all these other ideas and stuff and the Aryans and oh, we've, everybody's got to go against that idea. It's the Hitler thing versus going, well, what was Hitler saying? What, what, what's the deal? Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. He found something so powerful he was able to do what we're talking about happening in World War II. Maybe we ought to look at what he found there. Well, it takes a few generations, but then genetics somehow, people decide to get enough nuts and they don't have any care to it anymore. They're not attached directly to it. Grandma and granddad died and, uh, hey, what's this? I want to find out about it. Of course, this would be looked at as being white superiority or not, 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 anything, but uh, no, sorry, genetics stepped up to the plate and hit a home run here. So, the Vikings aren't Scandinavian, but of course I talked to you earlier just about the fact that, well, nobody was in Scandinavia in ancient times. Nobody was in Northern Europe. It was all covered with a mile and a half of ice. You take that away from it, you know, you can get down near closer to the Black Sea and Anatolia region and there are people living there. I recently did a video showing some gear man and it said that he was the farthest no northern found Homo sapiens at the time. But at 30,000 BC, and he was already wearing a shirt and pants and a coat, had shells all over it, all fancy, a headdress, all kinds of crap, and the most modern and most intricate toolkit on the planet at the time, before then and all the way through till now. You should see the kind of tools he has nowadays. He can build spaceships. It's freaking incredible. Mediterranean. As woke concepts are creeping into scientific fields such as anthropology, fewer resources are available to people that are interested in learning about the past rather than being force-fed an egalitarian political ideology that strives to replace biological reality with fictitious equity. Well, if you haven't noticed, it's happening rather rapidly here, but it's been something that's been going on since, oh, World War II-ish, trying to twist it and change the soup of reality here and trying to omit things like, oh, that symbol and the fact of how this all came to be and the fact that there's nordic type people even in egypt starting it all off and in fact well that was the whole thing that he had said something about and yeah there are blonde haired people attached to it too and all this other stuff uh, yeah yeah this is this is all reality can't apologize for him for what he did with it or what happened to humanity here off of it of course, what we're spoon fed on the idea of what it was about and what happened is not quite exactly the way it went on. I think it's just amazing Americans were able to get into that and save them because it's hard to get you to believe that Germany took on the world or the old world and they almost won. But America helped them out and uh, simultaneously we actually fought off the Japanese from Pearl Harbor all the way back through Midway and it ended up using the bomb on them and that just stopped all that shit, didn't it? It's amazing what you can find, but I find it sad that you have to dig, that you can't just go, well, I'd like to know about the ancient Aryans and then somebody puts out something that's not propaganda driven or trying to minimize it in some way or bring up other things like, well, there are some people that don't agree with it. Who gives a shit? What do most people agree with? What's the agreeance? 
Let's not have shows like that where it's just made to ruin that. We've probably seen enough of those. Just like we've probably seen enough bad Nazi movies and stuff. I mean, Indiana Jones was able to harp on it for years, but even he stopped and, and the Crystal Skull ones went with Russians. Because, you know, that's, that's the current thing. As opposed to Germany or anything like that. It's a worry about those communist types that are going to try to do something. And lo and behold, in this modern type, just like he's showing you here, they got rainbow flags over everything. They're trying to say that they don't want you to refer to race, no one whatsoever. They've been trying to get rid of that for years. Whenever somebody could just walk up, pick up a skull and go, oh, yeah, this is a black man. Oh, yeah, here's an oriental type person right here. they want to do away with that but then they now what they want to do away with is identifying anybody as male as female whenever again you can go up just look at the pelvis area if you have any of it left and be like that's a that's a lady there's a bunch of other ways to tell too but in this modern time I don't like it very much it's a whole bunch of ambiguity and everybody's got to blend into a fake bullshit that nobody agrees with and if you found out what they were trying to push on you you'd kick back in fact we're seeing some kickback now on all of these things because we're starting to get too many of them at one time going on and it got to the point of like hey oh and then we had the old chicken poke uh, the COVID and corona Let me know what you think downstairs here, but uh, this is showing you that finally India has stepped out formally, whereas it's all been informal before, formally stepped out and said, hey, all these people that are ruling over us in the higher class here aren't people from here, and he's wanting to kick them out so he can move up a level. Problem with that is, is that he's half and half himself probably and the people that are running it probably need to keep running it because they're Indians they've been there long enough they made most of this happen that's around them and the reason that they're at the point that they are today peace